Hey. So, uh, so Mike and I know each other from the AOL days. And it's great to have you in town. Thanks. AOL was my first job. <laughs> the first, like, working for the It was my first man. official job is when I, when I, the first time I actually had a boss. Mm. Right. Did you like that? I, I, actually, I did like it. I, I think I realized that, you know, coming in, in college, I decided I didn't ever really want to have a boss. So I thought I'd be an entrepreneur because I thought that was the best way to avoid ever having to work for anybody. And, um, and then coming to AOL, I realized that there was actually a lot to learn from bosses. Mm -hmm. And so I actually did, I did, I did like that. And I, I learned a lot being at AOL, actually. So, um, so what made you... I mentioned to the crowd that you started your first company in college. Mm -hmm. What on earth made you, as a college student, not go out and have fun and be thinking about business? Yeah, well, I'm not that, uh, you know, the, I, I guess at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a pretty focused person. And um, my, my first business actually kind of stemmed out of Washington, D.C. So uh, when I was in, so in my sophomore year, I had fallen in love with this girl who is now my wife. And um, she got a job coming to DC and working for Senator Packwood in the Finance Committee. And um, so I came to join her because I couldn't possibly be away from her for six months in college because that would have just been the end of us. And out in, uh, out in DC, there was this intern magazine called DC Intern. I don't even know if it's still around. Who knows? And it was this newsprint little These zine. These guys would know. Some of you And so when I came back to Eugene, Oregon, this nice little town that I you know, was in school in, I said, I'm going to start a magazine. And so I rallied up all my friends and said, we're going to write, you know, we're going to write stuff. And we're going to go to this, like, local news place. We, we started printing this, this zine, this, like, newspaper zine. Well, within, like, nine months, the zine, my, my staff, who I obviously couldn't pay, realized that they could get free stuff. Mm -hmm. So we started getting boxes of, like, you know, sunglasses review and snowboards and clothing. We started doing fashion shoots. And then we got picked up by Barnes & Noble. And suddenly, wow. like, I was in some airport. I'm like, my God, this zine is, like, sitting here in this newsstand, and, uh, and that's when I actually learned my first lesson, which was, you know, if you're going to start a business, make sure it's a business you really want to be in, because mm -hmm. I'll tell you, the magazine business is a really, really bad business. And so, um, so my, my first business really came out of D.C., and then after that, I, I kind of created business after business after business. Wow. Yeah. So what happened to the zine? Uh, I, I, at that point, I started learning about the web, and um, I handed the zine off to my music editor, who was getting you know, all the free music he could possibly consume by you know, reviewing records. And, uh, and I let him go off and run it. And then, I, and then I started building businesses that I thought actually would be businesses I'd want to run that were profitable, interesting, great businesses versus me you know, slinging ads to like, the local barber shop in Eugene, Oregon. And to, like, get, you know, so, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so was there any interesting path between that and user plane that you well, could tell us about? Well, I mean, so I went through a few iterations where, where I kind of had a good team around me. And I think it's true with a lot of entrepreneurs, whether they're successful or unsuccessful, there's an equal number of failures as there are successes. And so in between my kind of magazine days and user plane, there was another agency that I ran that ended up in like a colossal set of uh, lawsuits and, you know, badnesses all around the kind of web 1.0 bubble. And... Um, and, and, you know, and so, so I learned, I learned about a, lot, a lot of those lessons. And I think for me, you know, I, I loved business holistically, and I loved kind of all aspects of business. So I think on each one of those steps of whatever career I was in, I always wanted to be learning. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I carry back to all my lessons from all those different segments. And I also, in my career, generally ask myself, like, if I'm, you know, what, what, can, I, what can I be doing right now to learn a new skill that I hadn't learned previously? And so a lot of the jobs that I've taken or the companies I've gotten involved in were in areas that I didn't really know, and I wanted to learn on the job on doing that. And typically, that meant starting a company that had that kind of focus, because I probably wasn't qualified to <laughs> be doing it if I didn't know about it. So, right. um, so yeah, those lessons always carried forth, and then eventually I, you know, I, I, came, I came into MySpace. So, um, so actually, let's tell the audience a little bit about user plane, and I'd love to hear sure. the story about what was going on that you saw in the market at that time yeah. that led to the creation of the company. Sure. So, um, and I work with a lot of early stage startups, so the lessons I'm going to talk about are a lot of the lessons that I see in startups. So mm -hmm. it was a small team, and it, it was a good team from the perspective that there was me representing the kind of strategy and business component. There was somebody that represented the kind of product and design element, and then we had our CTO that obviously was technology. And I think in a lot of early stage businesses, if you're looking at getting into early stage, that kind of trifecta of skills typically makes a really, really good core founding team. Um, so it was three of us. We decided that we you know, wanted, wanted, to, wanted to build things, and we really uh, decided to attach ourselves initially to Flash. This was, I mean, ironically, that f mobile right. Flash was like killed today, or whatever. Uh, but this was, this was when Flash was just, you know, just coming out, right? And it happened to also tie in when 
they had released something called Flash Communication Server mm -hmm. that was a live backend server technology that allowed you to like stream your webcam and capture audio out of the browser. And at that point, that was a really big deal, right? And so we said, we want to build tools around this. Mm -hmm. And so the three of us designed kind of a model and saying, like, we're going we're gonna to license the tools out. And what year was this? I don't even remember. Okay. 90, In the two, the 2000, maybe 2000. I, I absolutely have no idea. <laughs> Okay. It might have been 2002. I'm not sure. Um, so, so anyway, so we decided we're going to build this business. We built out some software without knowing who the market was. Mm -hmm. Another really bad idea, by the way. Um, and then we started testing it, and then we basically found a market that picked it up, which at that point happened to be social networks, because they were just starting to come up, and online dating sites. And so we became the like masters of social networking and online dating sites, and basically became the kind of software infrastructure that ran all their live communication tools. And then we kind of stumbled into this world of, this, of a theme that AOL was pursuing at the time, which was the concept of like the infrastructure of the web and how you kind of capture audience and eyeballs on a bunch of websites that you don't actually manage yourself, mm -hmm. right? And we were very much there. So at the point of getting acquired, we had aggregated 100 million users that were using the user plane tool sets in one fashion or another across a whole network of sites that, that we didn't manage, right, or we didn't own. And then we had a revenue model that was both advertising-based and fee-based that sat on top of that. So I mean, I think like very many early stage teams, we had the right makeup of a good team. Mm -hmm. We tried things. We quickly adjusted to what worked. And then we laser focused on being the best at it. And that resulted in a very good thing. And in most companies that you see that are really successful online, they rarely are, uh, at their success point, they're rarely what they kind of started as, right? In most cases, the best teams adjust the businesses to the opportunities they find and the success they find. So that's also why when you talk to a lot of investors and you say, especially early stage investors, what are you looking for? The answer is, I'm looking for a great team. Because my belief is a great team, even applied to a bad business, will probably mm -hmm. fix the business or find a different business to be in where a mediocre team applied to a good business will probably fail, right? And so the team's really, really critical. And I think you know, if you're thinking about getting into early stage stuff, you really want to make sure you have that team preformed before you start talking to investors and all that stuff because I see so many early stage deals and you know, if somebody walks in and they're saying, oh, I'm outsourcing my tech and I can't find a product person, but I've got this really good business idea, it's, it's just too early for those discussions. Like you really need that team and that's a critical component to this. Yeah. So was there any point that your team, as you were you know, finding your place in the market, that you were just like, this isn't going to work? Oh, multiple times. I mean, we, you know, we, we did everything you expected. We delayed payroll by days until we had enough receivables to come in. We paid people through credit card loans. We, uh, you know, we, we had a point where originally we started with four founders, and one of our founders just didn't like the business direction. We bought him out of the business. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we went through all those things. We were, you know, so I think naturally you're always going to hit bumps in the road. And I mean, there have been companies that I've been investor and investor in or on the board of where they were weeks from going out of business and then they suddenly got acquired or, you know, or, or on the other hand, they were doing phenomenally well and then something happened and the whole business became, mm -hmm. you know, destroyed. And so I think the other component of being a great entrepreneur is being able to have a rock hard stomach to be able to walk through those scenarios and be ready for what that presents you. And I think when I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and I think it, it really speaks to people coming out of traditional corporate jobs, right? When you talk to people with traditional corporate jobs about the risk in them going into a startup that only has $150,000 or $200,000 in funding that may or may not work and they're going to lose benefits, health coverage, 401k plans, and all the things that go, a lot of people can't make that jump, which is also why you see entrepreneurship is typically a young, young person's game. So I think if you're thinking of going to entrepreneurship, you really need to make sure you're ready for the ambiguity mm -hmm. and the, the, the you know, unstable environment that it presents. Um, so one thing that really struck me, uh, being an insider at AOL during the time of the acquisition, was watching how you brought user plane into the company. Yeah. Um, what was impressive was AOL had acquired many companies through the years, but most of them had pretty much uh, disappeared over time. They had been either absorbed or shut down, and you really kept the integrity of the company from within this massive corporate corporation. Yeah. Um, you kept your company in LA. Mm -hmm. Was there ever any pressure to, to move the company? I think there were not, not, I think AOL at that time of acquisition was very supportive on keeping the company fairly independent. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that at the point the leadership in AOL understood that uh, you know, independent uh, entities typically could actually outpace and be in certain cases more successful than larger corporate entities. So we had that support. Um, but I think the other side of it was that we felt an ethical obligation to carry forward with the, with the acquisition and really perform to what we promised and continue to build that business. 
And whether that worked out as it was originally planned, you know, we wanted to put time in against that mission. And I've certainly worked with entrepreneurs that have made way more money than me, and they, they leave the first day post a deal. Um, and then I've, and, but you know, for me and my team, we thought it was important that we, we mm -hmm. spent time there. And we learned a lot through that experience, and I enjoyed that time. So that company is still running yeah. with an AOL. They are. Yeah, I talked to, uh, I t actually saw uh, some members of my staff a few days ago. And, um, and the, you know, they, they, they've, actually hit, they've actually grown in a good way. And like, it's actually pretty cool what they're doing. I think they're, again, kind of left alone, which is mm -hmm. good and bad. I think the bad part is they don't feel like they're chaperoned. They're not like they're not part of kind of the the mass as AOL, and that's also probably a good thing in certain mm -hmm. cases too. So, yeah. uh, is there any part of you that would like to take the reins of it again? And yeah, I do think there's else with it? there's always nostalgia for that business. Just like leaving MySpace, I had nostalgia for leaving MySpace, and I like the team there. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about doing some really good things that I think actually have some really nice merit. Um, and so I'll always be knocking on AOL's doors for different different companies I'm interested in. Right. So, yeah. so after the acquisition, you were a senior vice president at AOL. Yeah. Um, you stuck around for a while. Mm -hmm. And then you decided to jump back into the startup game, and you started a media company. Right. So at that point, I had been doing a lot of consulting for private equity firms. And I had seen um, there, was an, there was a company that one of the private equity firms held that was uh, doing some unique things in search. And search was an area I didn't really understand, and I didn't understand paid search, and I understood SEO, but I really wanted to understand search at depth. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, you know, this is an interesting company for me to get involved in because I'll learn something I really didn't learn. And search is such a core component of building successful consumer web businesses. I felt like that was an important lesson. Mm -hmm. And so that drew me into this company called Savo that we, that we uh, kind of took over business and then created some new things around it. And, uh, and that was another great experience, and we learned, learned a ton there. And it was, it was a media business all driven around content properties and all that kind of fun stuff. So how long were you at Savo? It was about a year. A so year. Uh, at the end of my first year, the company was kind of right. It was back on a good path because it had had some challenges. Um, it was doing nine figures in revenue. It was a, good, it was a big company uh, at that point. We had a few offices, and we had a lot of M&A interest. And so I talked to the, the board and said, look, you know, I have this opportunity to go over to MySpace. Savo's on a path that's going to get acquired. They got acquired within a few months of me leaving. Mm -hmm. um, it was just kind of a known, known exit at that point, and then, I, and, the, yeah, and then I jumped over to MySpace. So I think, uh, I think a lot of us watched that transition saying, what is Mike thinking? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, can, describe a little bit at the time that you went to MySpace. Yeah. Where were they on this, <laughs> on they, this path? Well, when I, I mean, they, they weren't in a good spot. Um, you know, <laughs> They had definitely passed the peak, and, um, and, they were, and they were severely overstaffed at that point. So mm -hmm. when I walked through the door, they were just finishing building this monstrous campus uh, down in Playa del, Playa Vista or Playa del Rey. And, um, and you know, we had like 24 international offices, uh, thousands of employees, and, um, and, the, and, the, and there, was no, there was no good metrics to really be found. Right. And, um, and so we kind of went into, I kind of went into this emergency mode with the team and said, look, you know, we have to substantially change the face of this business within months. Um, and then we have to find any way we can to kind of shore up the traffic loss to make sure that this business can have more than six months of survival in front of it, right? And so we did a lot to basically do that. And you know, the, the, metrics, the metrics when we left were much lower, of course, than we started, but, um, but actually at a fairly flat pace. And so at that point, the, the goal there, growth would have been a wonderful goal, but kind of existence and stabilization was, was honestly the, the, the focus. So you started uh, in operations, yeah. and then you, interestingly, took a co-CEO position. Yeah. So, um, so Mike was actually, he had a, a co-CEO running MySpace. I what did. was that like? Well, I mean, what, when I started, there were three of us that came in as the kind of turnaround exec team. And we all had different speci you know, specialties among us. I think that we quickly realized that the situation was much more dire than we had originally anticipated, and having three brains in the business was mm -hmm. probably not the most efficient way to run the company. Um, and so then we went through to, to, to a model to basically bring it back to one. And so there were a few kind of intermediate steps there that, that News Corp chose to go through in order to get it to that point. Right. So, so you took over the role. Yeah. And uh, I think I remember reading you reduced costs of the company like 90%. Yeah, like we, we did. Um, and it was, you know, it was as brutal as it sounds. Right. Um, and I think what we, you know, running, running small internet businesses, I knew what efficiency really looked like. And mm -hmm. then seeing AOL, and I understood how, uh, how you know, big companies can get slow and what they're doing. And so 
we basically said, look, we have to do a radical cultural shift. We have to change the staff. We have to change the process. And it was that, you know, MySpace was actually filled with an incredible amount of talented people, um, but I think that they had built up a lot of bad habits. And it's tough to break people of bad habits. Um, and it was just the fact that, like, it grew at a certain pace and there were certain procedures put in place that weren't really right. And so we pulled out of most of our international office, uh, markets, did a lot of joint ventures to wrap all of our ad inventory. We pulled down a lot of internal costs. We reduced our data center footprint. We went through a lot of work to get that to a, a semi-manageable cost base that was still high, right? And, okay. uh, and then we tried to do it quick. And so it ended up being, the whole, my whole turn at MySpace was basically like, t you know, two and a half years-ish. And I think like the last, the last six months was really focused on a sale that ended up being a fairly public sale of the mm -hmm. asset um, that also had a series of challenges with it because it was so public. And um, for those who didn't hear, Justin Timberlake is part of that acquisition. That's right. Part of that Justin team. took over the business. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so do we know what's happening there now? Uh, well, uh, so what happened was Specific Media, who's a, a fairly large you know, media company, um, bought the company. They brought in Justin as kind of one of their strategic partners in the business. And um, you know, I can only, I, I talked to them, I think I'm actually meeting with them this Friday to kind of catch up, but I, I, you know, my, if I was speculating, I think that they'll continue to focus on music and entertainment. Right. Because that's an interesting place for them to be, and it's one of the places that we found there was some good stable traffic, there was a lot of consumer interest that worked with the brand. But, I, but I'm eager to see too, you know, I mean, like, uh, we spent a lot of time on that strategy and they so far have been continuing with it, but we'll, we'll see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so you're still in LA. Yeah. And the last time I was there, uh, we were actually hosting an event there and I was astounded by the tech scene there. Yeah. We had like 500 people show up. Nice. Uh, we had yeah. like, I don't know, 16 startups. Yep. Um, plus, I mean, that <laughs> didn't include the 30 or so that it, you know, wanted, was beating down the door to, to demo. There's a thriving tech scene in yeah. LA. Yeah. What's going on there, and are you, are you a big part of it now? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really you know, active in the LA scene, so I do a lot of investing and then a lot of advising and board roles, and then I work with a lot of the venture groups to kind of identify your early stages. But I think it's, you know, it, there's kind of Silicon Valley and everything else, and we're in the everything else bucket, just as like DC's in the everything else bucket. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a certain breed of company that's getting born out of LA, and I think just as you're seeing here, with companies like Living Social, I mean, LA suddenly has some nice tent poles mm -hmm. of meaningful size companies that are growing, that are getting valued in the hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't think we have anything as big as this living social yet in LA. And I think that helps kind of build up those marketplaces, right? And, um, and I think it also creates a lot of angel wealth that ends up uh, you know, funding more businesses locally and it creates that nice ecosystem. So I think that as we see more and more successes in these local markets, you'll find better and better communities forming around them. Mm -hmm. and, I think, and that's exciting, right? And that's one of the reasons why I chose to stay in LA, because I like that community and I like that opportunity to connect with that audience versus Silicon Valley that has such a well-developed ecosystem around it. Right. Yeah. So what's next for you? So I mean, I, I, I've, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of looking at three different things and, uh, and have a management team that I work with kind of around these opportunities. So we, we focus on building uh, new businesses ourselves. And those are where we'll come up with concepts and we'll work with entrepreneurs and we'll, we'll kind of assemble teams around concepts and themes that we like. Um, we're looking at some M&A, so we're, we're looking at buying different companies that we have interest in and we have partners. And then we also take some strategic positions in businesses, which is more like our investing arm, where we, um, we find things that we think are interesting and we come and get involved and we, and we help. Right. And, um, and so we're kind of creating a loose structure around that. We'll kind of talk more about it in the next few weeks. It's, you know, I, I got done with my operational role in MySpace in, uh, in September, and then uh, I took October to kind of nail down our partnerships and financing for this next business, and then we'll, we'll launch in November. So it's, it's been a kind of a fast transition, but I think we're in a neat spot. So um, I have two final questions. Yeah. The first is, oops, that's my little alarm. <laughs> um, in the spirit of mobility, yeah. uh, mobility is such an important part of new businesses and what we think about in terms of you know, user interaction and all that. Yep. How do you think about mobility from an entrepreneurial perspective, from an investing perspective, as you work with young companies? Yeah, well there's a few themes that I can talk about and it's maybe not be a well-structured thesis, but some of the things that I think are important. Uh, one is that you know, the, the, that kind of app platform and the starting point uh, as the phone is a substantial disruption to search, mm -hmm. right? So whereas a typical user on the computer is going to go to search first and then go to where they're going to go, even if they know the URL that they want to go to, they'll still search for it, click Google's paid ad, and then end up at that website. Um, whereas on the phone, you don't do that, right? You would start directly with an application mm -hmm. or in a potentially an app store to search for that application. But it, it, it's a, it, that's a really big deal, right? Um, probably one of the biggest changes, and which is also, I think, uh, why Google's been so intelligent in their investments in Android. 
because they want to control that entry point in that platform, which I think is also why there's a Google-Apple tension, I think, between that. So I think that's fascinating. Um, I think the second part that's really, that I really like as a general theme is the concept of kind of intelligent push services. So I, I, want the, I want the phone to just deliver me the weather at 7 a.m. every morning. I don't want to have to go someplace to get the weather. I want the stock prices pushed to my phone at noon. I don't want to have to go there, right? And I haven't used the, you know, the voice technology f on the new uh, iPhone yet. Uh, substantially, Would but you like I think to try it? no. I, I'm, I'm well aware how it works, uh, <laughs> but I think that that's like where it goes, right? Is the concept of like how does the how does the computer become progressive on pushing stuff to me, so I'm not requesting things all the time, right? How can it preemptively get in front of my needs? And I like that technology on the web. I like it delivered in email. I think that's in a certain sense what a lot of the daily deal sites have captured is like we're mm -hmm. going to push stuff to you. And I think that concept of push is very much back. I think on mobile it even becomes more powerful because it'll say. It's a, it's a location aware device, it's a network aware device, it's potentially a friend aware device. It understands your routine, it has capturing on your calendar. You know, there's a lot of things it can do intelligently for you that make, makes your life better. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have a theme around push that we really, really like. And I think mobile is a good place to capture that. So, yeah. um, so I wanted to just read this quote. Um, so you wrote an article for Fortune recently mm -hmm. and uh, talking about your MySpace experience. And you said, for me, MySpace was actually a perfect fit for the following reasons. I want to know if it could be done, yeah. if we could revive a legacy internet brand that had so many challenges. I want to study how a large media property worked from the inside out, and I wanted to do it from my hometown of LA. Yeah. Uh, knowing what you know now, would you do it again, or would you like to do it again? Yeah, I, 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 I would do it again, um, because I think that uh, I, I learned enough through that process that I do it differently and I do it better. And so uh, just as I've done a lot of startups, and with each startup, I just get a little bit more efficient. I get a little bit better. I can identify things earlier, I think, on working within large organizations and what that means. There's a, there's a temptation now to go back through that process again and do it again and do it better, right? So you still believe it's possible? Uh, I think it's, I th the, what I separated is that it's, it may or may not, and this goes for AOL or Yahoo or any of the large assets, which is that it may or may not be possible to save the brand, mm -hmm. but I think it's definitely possible to save the business. Right? And I think that you have to divorce the brand from the business in those cases because the brand necessarily can't necessarily be the business. And so, um, so I spent a lot of time talking and thinking and actually writing about my thoughts on Yahoo and AOL. And I think that there's a lot of savable business components of those companies that can actually revitalize the business of AOL, the business of Yahoo. But I worry about in the internet space when brands are being created so carelessly and so quickly whether or not once you've kind of infused the global population on what is MySpace, what is Yahoo, if it's really worth the time to try to re-educate a population around that. And I think that's, you know, we, we double down to change the state of the brand. And I think we would have been better to have focused on saving the business if that meant changing or manipulating or complementing the brand. And that's a big differentiation that I came to that conclusion of. And that's a very expensive lesson for a lot of companies. And so I talk about that a lot to make sure other people can learn from that. Yeah. Thank you so much for being no here tonight, and yeah. uh, we all look forward to what's coming. Thanks. Thank you.